welcome everybody. Um, I don't know if I'm um, highlighted or not, but uh, I am the head of research at Theos Think Tank, for those who don't know, and I'm going to be chairing this evening. Um, I'd like to give a particularly warm welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. Um, for those who don't know, Theos is a um, faith and society think tank. We exist to enrich the conversation in the UK around faith and belief. Uh, we do that with research, with events, public commentary, and even a couple of podcasts. And tonight we're specifically considering how spiritual and pastoral care can be navigated where physical presence is restricted um, or even prevented altogether. Uh, not least, uh, we think this is an interesting con conversation because um, such care is so often associated with being physically present with people and that sort of close quarters accompaniment. The event is inspired by the findings of our most recent research into the impact of COVID on university chaplaincy, which was launched last month. Um, that research was kindly funded by the St. Luke's College Foundation, and it looks at how spiritual and pastoral care in one context, higher education chaplaincy, has coped with the challenges, the changes, and maybe even the opportunities uh, that have come with this very different world we're living in at the moment. And with that in mind, our discussion tonight will focus on a consideration of the pandemic's impacts on chaplaincy in a variety of different contexts. Uh, but of course, this is an issue which will have affected almost all of us at some level, whether religious or not, um, in the last year, given the experiences we've all had of physical isolation. Um, and on a more personal note as well, it's an issue which is quite close to my heart because I also used to be a university chaplain uh, in a Quaker context before I was working at Theos. So I'm really excited to be um, overseeing this event tonight. Really excited to hear from our panel and from all of you in the Q&A that follows. Um, after I finish speaking, Simon Perfect, a researcher at Theos and the report author is going to tell us a bit about the research findings themselves. And then our other speakers will give their own reflections on this wider theme. We're really grateful to have such a rich and varied panel for you tonight. Um, and I'm now delighted to introduce you to each of our speakers. So firstly, Simon Perfect is a researcher at Theos and the author of our new report, as I said. That report is entitled Relationships, Presence and Hope, University Chaplaincy During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Outside of Theos, he's also a researcher and tutor at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Mia Kite-Hillborn is Head of Spiritual Healthcare for Guys and the St. Thomas NHS Trust and runs the only chaplain-led postgraduate certificate in healthcare chaplaincy with London South Bank University. She's also chaplain and trustee for the Firefighters Memorial Trust, senior brigade chaplain for the London Fire Brigade and committee member for the Fire and Rescue Services Chaplains Association. Lindsay Meader is the lead theatre chaplain for the Diocese of London and senior chaplain of Theatre Chaplaincy UK. And prior to this, she served for 14 years as the associate rector of St. James Piccadilly. She's also the first full-time theatre chaplain in the Diocese of London and the Church of England. Lindsay Van Dyke is an accredited humanist funeral celebrant at Humanists UK and trained to master's level at the University of Humanistic Studies in Utrecht to provide humanist and existential counselling, coaching and pastoral care. Lindsay is chair of the Non-Religious Pastoral Support Network and was the first humanist lead chaplain ever to be appointed in the UK. Last but not least, Gemma Simmons is a sister of the Congregation of Jesus and a senior research fellow at the Margaret Beaufort Institute of Theology in Cambridge, where she directs the Religious Life Institute. She was a chaplain in the universities of Cambridge and London, as well as a chaplaincy volunteer in Holloway Prison for 26 years. Her book on retreats at home called Dancing at the Still Point is due for publication by SBCK in July, 2021. We're so delighted to have representation from so many different contexts and traditions tonight. And I think by this point, we've all been at online events where the chat is a little bit of a distraction while speakers are actually talking. So tonight we're actually going to disable the chat function while people are giving their formal um, contributions just to try and give them our full attention. I think that's particularly appropriate given the themes we're talking about as well. And so much of that is really investing in presence with people. But do store up your questions, uh, because once those formal contributions have ended, we're going to open up the chat box again for you to post them. 
Uh, and we'll have Q&A time for about 45 minutes from around um, 7.45 until 8.30. We've also allowed people to submit questions in advance, as you'll have seen. And I don't think we're going to have time for asking all of those tonight before we open up to the floor. We obviously want to give some benefit of actually being at the event. Even I'm sure you'll want to ask questions of the speakers live too. Um, but uh, I hope we get through some of them anyway. Um, and you'll also find in the chat box links to the reports that we're going to be talking about tonight and also Theos's supporter program if you'd like to support our work more generally. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Simon, who's going to talk us through um, the findings of the report uh, before we hear our reflections from our other panelists. So Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Maddie. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to be speaking to you all and to see so many people. It's really exciting. Um, I'm going to be talking about our new report. You can see it on here that's been looking at the experiences of university chaplaincy during the pandemic. And we wanted to do a short snapshot uh, piece of research looking at universities, because we know that there's been a massive uh, mental health crisis on campus and chaplains have been at the forefront of that alongside the formal counselling services in universities. So just to set the context then, a little bit about university chaplaincy in the UK. This chart here on the right summarises their main activities, providing pastoral and spiritual support to students and staff, regardless of religion or belief. Many people who access these services are not religious. Often they do lead uh, religious services or practices, and they also play important roles in building community. And much of their work, as we will hear later on tonight, of course, is about building relationships and being a listening ear. On the left, we've got some stats, uh, general stats about this field taken from the, the major study, Chaplains on Campus, which is the biggest study of university chaplaincy conducted so far, and we're deeply indebted to them for this field. They found that there are about a thousand chaplains, faith advisors, and pastoral carers in UK universities. About two thirds of these are Christian. They're not evenly spread. Older, more elite universities tend to have more chaplains than younger ones. And importantly, this is a sector that is dominated by volunteers. Nearly two thirds of university chaplains are volunteers. So what then have university chaplains been doing during COVID? We spoke to 16 chaplains, different religions and beliefs in universities around the country. During the various lockdowns, they've had to transfer most of their activities online. They've continued to be providing the pastoral and spiritual care to students and staff. Some have seen significant increases in requests for their support from the isolated, the lonely, and sadly, of course, for many people who have been bereaved. Some of our interviewees had seen an increase in people wanting to talk about big existential and spiritual issues, uh, the problem of suffering and meaning in life. And being able to talk about those kinds of things is one of the ways in which chaplains are distinct from their, their counselor colleagues. As well as that individual support though, university chaplains have been crucial in maintaining a sense of community on campus in lots of different ways. And we heard lots of very interesting examples here. They've continued running prayer and meditation groups and discussion groups or set up new ones. One of our interviewees uh, in a Scottish university had set up an invite only book club for staff that he'd identified as potentially isolate, isolated and lonely. He'd set that up before the pandemic, but it became even more important during COVID, supporting those staff and building relationships across different teams. And some university chaplains have found that this has been an opportunity to have much greater visibility than before by becoming much more active on student social media. In one of our case studies, the chaplains were producing loads of videos with students discussing everything from racism to multiculturalism and different religious festivals. And in this case, the chaplaincy was able to generate a sense of togetherness and belonging, which is so important at this time. As an example of what some chaplaincies have been up to, um, I've, I've got some uh, photos here from St. Peter's House Chaplaincy in Manchester. They set up a project called The Well, where they've been providing emergency meals to students and staff who need it. And they provided over 7,500 meals so far. 
And on their website, they have a whole suite of recipes, cookery classes, videos about well-being, meditation, and faith journeys. Not all chaplaincies in universities, of course, have been able to do this, this kind of thing. It all depends on how well-resourced the chaplaincies were before COVID. Now, in some universities, shifting online has made it more has made chaplaincy more immediately accessible to people because people can dial in and and get the support they need from their own rooms but in other cases it seems that the loss of physical presence on campus has created real real challenges that chapla chaplains have had to navigate and i've listed some here sometimes chaplaincy work is about <laughs> Uh, simply sitting there in silence with someone who, for example, is grieving. Part of their work is about conveying empathy and understanding in an inarticulate and embodied way. And that's potentially harder to do over a Zoom call. Like everybody else, chaplains and university chaplains have lost what we might call water cooler moments. So these are informal moments outside of meeting settings where you just bump into people and chat. And for university chaplains, those moments can be really crucial for helping them to identify people who are struggling, but who would not actively reach out for support. So the loss of those moments does risk vulnerable people falling through the cracks. Uh, we also heard that in some universities, volunteer chaplains have not been able to provide the same level of support uh, to students and staff as they had previously because of the pressures of their other commitments during COVID. And that has an impact on the provision of Chapman as a whole. Now, that's not the case in all universities. And in, in other universities, we found that volunteers have continued to provide the central support. But it does show the fragility of the current system in universities, where the, there's such a reliance upon volunteers to provide this kind of care. I'm able to go into more detail in the Q&A, but taking a step back then what can we learn from this sort of snapshot piece of research that we've done into this sector firstly the pandemic experience has reiterated just how important chaplains are to university life despite the challenges in general they have maintained an accompanying presence building relationships with and between students and staff and helping to combat loneliness and crucially, they have been encouraging hope, and that's something that's been never been as important as now. University chaplains, of course, will be working out what went well and what, what didn't go well during this, uh, during this period and wanting to build on it going forwards. We recommend that chaplains offer a blended service in the future with the offer of support online as well as in person to maximize uh, their accessibility. Secondly, it's important that universities ensure that their chaplains are properly supported and resourced. And now that we've, now that the pandemic has demonstrated once again, how important chaplains are to university life, we hope that, we hope that universities will step up on this. From our interviews, it seems that in some universities, chaplains have been in, more included in decision-making in the pandemic, but in others, we did hear that some chaplains feel that their contributions have been overlooked. They've been underappreciated. And sometimes senior staff in universities still not properly understanding what chaplains are there for. If universities want to get the most out of their chaplains, managers need to be actively getting to know them, supporting them, promoting chaplaincy regularly to students and staff. We think that universities also need to be gradually expanding the range of chaplains to reflect the major religious belief groups on campus, including humanism. And this was, a, this was an important recommendation that came out of the chaplains on campus project. In the short term, this would mean recruiting more volunteers, but as we've seen in COVID, that can be, that can be a fragile approach. So in the long term, universities need to be looking for ways to fund more of their chaplaincy places, perhaps in partnership with local religious belief groups. Finally then, I think there are implications of this beyond higher education. Even after the pandemic, for many people, life is not going to go back to the way it was. There's research indicating that remote working will be much more embedded. So big employers need to be thinking about how can they create opportunities for informal socializing and building relationships across different teams. In addition, there's never been a more important time for
for employers to take the spiritual health of their employees seriously. There's survey evidence um, suggesting that a lot of people are currently reevaluating what's important in their life and grappling with big questions about what makes life meaningful. And one of the ways in which big employers can respond to these changes is by providing some sort of access to chaplaincy, uh, whether internal to their organization or perhaps shared across organizations in a local area, such as the Canary Wharf multi-faith chaplaincy. Big employers should take this moment to consider what are the benefits of having someone who can support individual well-being and who also have a remit to build relationships across the organization and to encourage hope. I'll leave it there, but looking forward to questions afterwards. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, really struck by what you say there about there's never been a more important time for us to be thinking about these issues. So um, good timing for us to be having this event, I guess, but also really excited to see what, um, of course, the other panellists have to say about that as it manifests in their own context. So we're now going to pass over to Lena <coughs> Kite Hilborn, who's going to speak about this from a health and fire brigade chaplaincy context. Mia, over uh, to you. Thank you. Thanks, Freddie. Hello, everybody. Um, so I come from, um, uh, my main job is Guy's and St. Thomas's, um, which is a, a large um, multi-faith uh, chaplaincy team, multi-faith and belief um, of various uh, views. Um, we try and match our um, team to the uh, local uh, population of Lambeth and Southwark, and also the population of staff. Um, uh, um, and also the population that the hospitals actually cover. So our hospitals are based upon Lambeth and Southwark, but they also have a hinterland of Kent, Sussex, East Sussex and West Sussex, um, and a bit of Surrey as well. So we go right the way around. And we also have some uh, national uh, centres as well. So it's a very, very mixed bag of people. Um, and we have a very large um, BAME, uh, chaplaincy team. Um, in fact, it's majority um, BAME. So um, we have been hit quite badly with um, some of the issues about um, black and minority ethnic staff in terms of our own team. Um, I'm afraid during COVID, uh, one of our team members did actually die of COVID, one of our BAME people, and another one had long COVID as well um, and has now left the team. So um, we've taken it very, very seriously, all of the issues involved, particularly with black and minority ethnic. Um, and uh, we continue to have a lot of people shielding um, and um, we're trying very hard to think through um, what we can do in order to still use people who are in a very awkward position in terms of our chaplaincy team when we are actually one of the major COVID hospitals. So Guy's in St. Thomas's has been, um, and still continues to be, um, uh, an infectious disease specialist hospital. Um, we had our very first COVID patient on the 6th of um, February, 2020. Um, and um, it's just not stopped. Um, and at one point we had, uh, I think it was nine intensive care, critical care units um, that were opened. Um, the whole hospital, um, there's around, uh, we just joined the Royal Brompton and Harefield. It's all one big trust as of uh, last month. So we've got around 22, 23,000 staff. Um, and we have um, uh, whole departments just literally closed um, in order to uh, create these surge beds for the vast numbers of COVID patients. I think for London, if you think during the Blitz, there were around 20,000 people died in London during the Blitz. Um, so far, around 14, 15,000 people have died of COVID in London so far. Um, and since January of last year, we've lost 24 staff members as well. Uh, not all from COVID. Um, and then obviously there've been all the other deaths as well. So it's been huge. It's been absolutely huge. In, in the Second World War, no patients died during the Second World War at Guy's and St. Thomas's um, of, uh, of, of the bombs, etc. I mean, they died of other things, but nobody, nobody was hit, even though the hospital was hit uh, multiple times. 
um, 11 staff died, um, uh, but no, no patients died. Um, so it's been worse for us than the war. Um, so therefore it's been the worst time in living memory, I think for us. So that's been a big issue. In terms of the uh, work that we do, we've been working with patients, staff and relatives. We haven't stopped doing that work at all. We've been very much on the front line. We haven't been out of the hospital. We've been in the hospital on the wards. Uh, we've been using PPE. We've all been fit mask tested. Um, we've all had to make sure when we go on COVID ward, you have a shower when you come home. We haven't used um, scrubs. We've been using our own clothes and the clothes that we've had to use have to be washed every single day that you come home um, in, in, a, in a way that uh, would kill COVID. So that's been, been an issue in itself. Um, there's been many, many memorial services. Some have been online, some have been um, face to face. Um, we've done, uh, or I've done, lots and lots of weddings, um, both for staff and for patients. Um, and uh, with very few people there, um, people who really wanted to get married. Uh, I have done so many funerals um, for people who don't have anybody who uh, wishes to arrange a funeral for them, or they just simply don't have anybody. Um, and so many baptisms and blessings, that's been absolutely huge. I think one of the big things have been uh, for us has been, we've joined up with um, the psychologists, the staff psychologists through occupational health. And we've now uh, got a program called Staff Support Chaplains, which has been funded for so far 18 months, possibly a further year and possibly uh, it will continue after that. We've got three chaplains through that, which we've broken up into seven different people to try and get a spread of faith and belief and color, ethnicity, so that people have somebody that they can talk to who they have an instant connection with. Um, these staff support chaplains are to help the staff who have literally um, put their lives on the line um, and have uh, done everything they can do with tremendous, tremendous impact upon their families and their friends. Um, some people are also carers at home. Some people um, have lived, you know, you've seen the, the TV, people have lived in caravans and things like that rather than um, impact others who they've been looking after. Uh, people haven't seen their parents or, or brothers or sisters for year, for over a year um, because of the because of the work that we do at GSTT. The other big thing that we're involved in at the moment is vaccine hesitancy. So now all uh, NHS people, staff who don't have, um, uh, who haven't had a COVID vaccine are gonna have a, an individual text and then they're offered a, uh, a call from either a clinician, um, their line manager or a chaplain to talk through, we, we talk through the uh, spiritual, ethical, and um, cultural reasons why they choose not to have a vaccine. Um, and obviously um, around, um, well, in some places up to 60% of uh, BAME people are not receiving, are not uh, agreeing to have a vaccine. So that is a big issue um, and it continues to be a big issue. Um, we're also doing things like having Quran cubes, uh, only the Muslim um, faith seems to have produced these little cubes, but they're white clean little uh, electronic devices that you can uh, take to somebody and uh, they, can, they can hear the, the Quran. Um, we uh, hope to have others in, in other faiths, but at the moment it's just Muslims. Um, so that's a completely different way of working. Um, we're doing, uh, we're still giving communion, we're, we're, not, um, we're not anointing with a hand, we're anointing with a stick. Um, we're doing all things like that. So we're doing a lot of stuff um, with um, tablets so that you might have somebody who is dying and the relatives uh, can't come in. They live a long way. They're shielding, et cetera. So you would have a, a tablet there and, and you would say prayers or you would give um, a final blessing or have a silence with, with the family uh, on a tablet and you would be there holding and, 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 and saying whether or not the patient is moving at all. Are they flicking their eyes open? Can, uh, do they appear to be moving a finger or whatever it is close to them? So resilience- okay. Just slightly over, just- Okay. Just, um, don't stop talking just now, but I'm just warning you that we're slightly over time. Okay. 
No, I, I'll, I'll finish now. Just to say that with the fire department, um, the fire department, obviously, the, uh, they've had Grenfell. So they've had Grenfell, they've also lost some staff, and now they've got um, the thing about the, um, the wages and the, no, no um, increase in salary. And um, the fire department, they haven't worked as hard as the hospitals, but the fire department are angry, 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 angry. And I think the future is going to be harder than the past. Thank you, Mia, and apologies for um, cutting in there. Um, that gives us a really um, vivid picture of how brutal the reality is, I think, for people providing this care, which um, is helpful and sobering. Um, we're going to now pass to Lindsay Meader, who's going to talk a bit about her experience in theatre chaplaincy um, for um, a different view. Um, sure with its own challenges. Thanks Maddie, good evening everyone. I've been involved with Theatre Chaplaincy for over 11 years and have been senior chaplain of Theatre Chaplaincy UK for the last nine. During most of that time I was trying to develop Theatre Chaplaincy on top of a full-time parish role. Over the first half of 2019 we began conversations with the Diocese of London to impress upon them the importance and the potential of Theatre Chaplaincy. And in the autumn of 2019, I moved away from my parish role to focus on theatre chaplaincy full time as part of a three year pilot project with the Diocese of London. I took up my new role on the 1st of October 2019, having no idea just what lay ahead. Theatre chaplaincy is an almost exclusively incarnational ministry. We don't have an office or a physical base and work solely by assigning chaplains to theatres where they visit regularly and consistently to get to know the buildings and not just um, understand the world of all those who work inside those buildings. And of course, that's not just performance. It's front of house, it's those who work backstage, those who work on the box office, in administration, on stage door and so forth. Yesterday, as you may have seen on the news, was the first anniversary of our theatres going dark. The effect on our chaplaincy and how we work has been profound. We had to go back to the drawing board to discover new ways of working, looking at what we could adapt and what we needed to create. One of the first challenges we faced was channels of communication. Usually we would communicate with our theatres and the people inside in person, sometimes through notices and announcements on the company and stage four notice board, sometimes through a message in someone's pigeonhole or via an email to the company manager or the theatre manager. All of these became obsolete overnight when our buildings closed down and our company and theatre managers were furloughed. Before lockdown, we published a quarterly printed prayer diary in which we would pray for a different group of the theatre community every single week. During lockdown, we have now changed this to a daily prayer diary where we pray for a different group every day and we post that on Twitter and on Facebook. We found that social media has been really important in playing a role to assure people that we are still here, we are still available and ready to provide a listening ear by phone, by Zoom, by email or by text. At the time our theatres went dark, I had recently realised a long held ambition to start a late night liturgy for theatre people after their shows. Late night Lent was to run every Thursday at 11pm in the fully consecrated stone chapel in the house of St Barnabas, a private members club in Soho and therefore an ideal and unique base. On Thursday the 17th of March we moved this online to Facebook Live. At first we thought our theatres would only be dark for a few weeks but by Easter it was very clear this was developing into a marathon and not a sprint. When late night Lent came to an end there was clearly no point in continuing a post-show service when there were no shows. So we needed to do something different, to offer some kind of support and accompaniment to all those theatre folk who could no longer, we could no longer encounter in person. So the next initiative we started was matinee meditation and prayer, a half hour liturgy live streamed at 2.30 every Wednesday and Saturday, when most matinee performances would be beginning, which seemed a particularly pertinent time. It became apparent that social media would be the best way to reach our target audience, and we soon learned we could be more effective if our meditations highlighted or made reference to particular shows, particular people, theatres, developments and initiatives, so we could then tag them and make them aware of us. It paid off in unexpected ways. 
and allowed me to get to know members of the theatre community whom I have yet to meet in person. I've since heard from a number of people that they don't tune into every meditation, but there's a great comfort in knowing that we are there regularly and consistently throughout this whole roller coaster, and that they can watch the meditations live or later in their day or week when they feel in need of a pick-me-up. One of the biggest advantage of live streaming liturgies is the accessibility and the anonymity for those attending. They can tune in without anyone knowing and therefore dip their toe in the water and try something that they might never dare to come to in person. In August, when redundancies began to really bite, we started another new project, The Green Zoom, a weekly online meeting for those missing their theatre jobs and life as they knew it. This provides a safe place to share stories, to support and console one another. We've always been here for people of all faiths and of none, and it's very important to provide a supportive space that's welcoming for those who don't consider themselves to have a faith. The Green Zoom, which runs all year round, does just that. At the end of September, I was finally, very belatedly, licensed to my new post by the Bishop of London. Although we were very limited in the number of people who could be physically present, it was a great opportunity to bring those people together for the first time in a long time, and a crucial opportunity, a third of the way through the pilot project, to reinforce our ministry and its value to both the church and the profession. The service included many messages of support and performances, some filmed remotely from many well-known faces, including Dame Judi Dench, Sir David Suchet, Rowan Williams, Stephen Fry, and the male and female leads in Hamilton. The service was live streamed on YouTube and has reached an audience of over 700, a lot more than we could ever fit inside mm. the Actors' Church. Our online Christmas celebration, Candles and Stars, was similarly successful with an audience of over 800. In December, we also offered a weekly late night Advent liturgy and a weekly discussion group, and we're now doing the same this Lent. Our Lent project is called Words for the Wilderness, Soft Words for Hard Times. We've invited a series of well-known actors to read poems for us, poems that speak not just to the themes of Lent, but also to the themes of this last extraordinary year, when many feel as if so much has been stripped away. These poems form the focus for Late Night Lent and the weekly discussion group. So this pandemic has introduced us to new routes and insight into reaching a wider community. Before, we mostly encountered those in work, mainly in the West End. Our online communities and liturgies and activities have enabled us to reach out to and meet other members of the community up and down the country, working or not. Going forward, it feels very important to maintain some of this as our theatres finally reopen. Keen as I am to get back to in-person visits, conversations and those all essential water cooler moments. Certainly, it looks likely we will continue to offer some online liturgies and activities. But I also feel we need to be very aware of the reaction that is still to come when we do get to the other side, as we settle into whatever the new normal will look like. Only then can people begin to really process just what we've lived through, and it's important we can be on hand for that. I hope that by our continuing presence online and in person, we bring some sense of hope, but there will be many, especially those who have suffered the heaviest losses, for whom hope seems in very short supply. It is then that our presence and our accompaniment is needed more than ever, not so much to bring, but to embody that hope. Thank you very much. Back to May. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I feel soft words for hard times is uh, it's really a mantra to live by, uh, certainly at the moment. <laughs> um, we're now going over to Lindsay Van Dyke, who's going to speak uh, from the context of her experience as a lead chaplain. Thank you very much, Maddie. And um, just to make it confusing for everybody, one Lindsay after another, but we're both very proud that we've got the original spelling is what we had decided. So nice to see, Lindsay, you've got the same spelling. Mm -hmm. um, very nice to see that there's so many people attending tonight. I, I know that you've been attending some other kinds of meetings as well around what we've learned around COVID and various kinds of themes and uh, ways of working, uh, for instance, within hospital and different kinds of sectors and areas where chaplaincy is present. 
Tonight, I'm going to focus, as Simon Perfect has as well introduced, on the physical presence and the loss of physical presence during COVID time, and narrating that from my experience as a lead chaplain, but mostly as well through my team. Because, of course, lead chaplain is nothing with your team, and how we've actually addressed that during our pandemic, and that's still ongoing, unfortunately, of course, as well. So physical presence is so important, isn't it? And especially during this time where we've been de deprived of physical presence. I hear a lot from patients, but also staff and family members, how hard it is not to be able to hold somebody's hand, to give them a hug, to even be in close quarters. And that physical presence has a real sense of meaning and, and purpose as well, and in which we shape our lives, that relational presence. And when you lay that back to chaplaincy, it has everything to do with what we are there to do, that physical presence, that accompany them um, to be alongside somebody, to accompany them throughout their narrative, their story, their personal experiences. And now all of a sudden we have COVID and that has been restricted. And that loss of bodily experience or to be alongside somebody has all of a sudden changed how we have to engage with people. And how does that look like? Even when we are now able to sit alongside a patient's um, bedside, it is still with a different way of relating because of course with PPE, you still can't see the, the body language. Before you all came on as well, we had a bit of a, a informal chat as well about how important the body language is. And Mia very much confirmed that as well about how important it is to see, for instance, um, somebody smile, which you can't always see of course with a mask on. If somebody's fidgeting under the table, you can't see my hands right now, but what does that indicate? What kind of experience are they having if you can't fully see the bodily experience? So with physical presence, even when being along the bedside, I've come to realize, and my team members as well, that it's a different way of relating. So even when you're there in the room, how do you communicate what are the subtle kind of cues, the, the bodily experiences that you usually tend to see but can't see now. So we found that we're narrating a lot what's happening. So may that be when you're in the room where you've got your PPE on and you're smiling, which can't be seen, to actually say, I'm smiling right now. You can't actually see it, but I'm actually smiling. Or to describe other feelings and feeling quite sad to hear that, that you're going through this because they can't always see your, your face. But even when it's over the phone, because of course we can't always be in the room, that's also of a key importance to actually narrate those, those descriptions that they can't physically see of you right now. So one of my volunteers, um, she helped me as well to set up a, a phone support service that we're doing in the hospital. And she looked through the policy that I'd written. She's actually on here tonight. So sorry, Kathy, I'm gonna name you. Um, but Kathy, she, she looked through the document and she's been doing some phone support service herself throughout the COVID pandemic. And what she added was a brilliant phrase. And she said, a smile can be heard. And that's absolutely true. But also silence is also still important when you're on the phone. And what does that silence entail? Is it a smile? Do you narrate the smile? Is the smile warm? Does it come across? Or do you also have to say, I'm actually now being silent, but I'm still listening, I'm still here. So it's trying to accompany people in a different way. Now, what we've learned, there's so many different learnings, so I won't go through all of it because I know we've got a Q&A section, but what I mainly want to come across is that we're not alone. So we're not alone in our own chaplaincy teams. We have been reaching out as well across trusts, which is brilliant to see. May that be through the JSIC email that I know a lot of people that are attending tonight are on or may that be through um, personal relationship that you've built. It's also, we're not an island when you look within your own trust. So as Mia already touched upon with psychology links, it is trying to create those specific links between services, psychology, staff well-being. What do you have as similarities and where do you differ? So where does your service uh, offer something additionally, something extra, but can still make those connections to have that holistic care service um, as you all probably know, that biopsychosocial spiritual model to link all those layers of a person's overall well being because they're crucial, especially during these existential and spiritual challenging times. But also, to re identify what is chaplaincy? It was a real question who are we? Who are we there for? What do we want to accomplish? Who are we now with the presence being limited? And can we still do what we used to do if it's over the phone or through other kinds of connections like we're meeting through today? 
like a Zoom or a Skype platform. So it's to almost re-identify who we are or to reconfirm who we are and to find meaning through that exercise. And last but not least, um, about hope. Hope was also a topic that came up with um, um, tonight's subject. And what is hope, especially when we can't always know what's, what's in the future, what lies ahead. So it's almost that fine balance between hope and realism without being deprived of hope. So redirecting that hope and what that looks like to still have people feel that they have a direction, meaning and purpose. And I'll be happy to explore that further with all of you in the QA as well. So I'll just hand over to, um, to Maddie again. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, there was so much to think about there, really, really helpful um, reflections. Um, we are now going um, ourselves last but not least <laughs> to Gemma Simmons, um, who's going to talk to us about um, Ignatian spirituality um, and her work in that area. Oh, wow. So thank you. After that extraordinary sort of smorgasbord of, of amazing initiatives, um, I don't know about everybody else listening, but I've been sitting here feeling simultaneously exhausted, um, but also absolutely thrilled by the amazingly creative ways in which all the chaplains we've heard about uh, and from have found ways to, to hold things together with and for others. Um, and I'm very aware that there are some very, very fine chaplains uh, listening here. Uh, Roberta Canning, that means you for a start, and Helen Bailey, because I know you're in there somewhere. Um, but uh, it's, it's great to see some, some old friends and colleagues, but also to see so many of you who are involved in this work. And I really want to do something just a little bit reflective as to not only what you have been trying to do, but maybe just some reflective moments for those of you who are feeling that you've given everything you've got to this and that um, you know you might be in danger of being eaten alive by it. Um, so maybe this is just something a bit more gently reflective for you as well as for the people whom you serve. So I wonder if I would be able to get my, um, uh, if I would be able to get my screen shared, please. So you've got something rather more exciting to look at than me, because that's a very good idea. Ugh. And I always get this wretched, great thing. Okay, so I go from the beginning. So we're just going to be looking a little bit at uh, chaplaincy in a time of pandemic. We've been hearing from so many of, of um, my fellow speakers this evening about how important it is in chaplaincy generally to learn to read the signals, but how much more both urgent and uh, challenging that's become in this time when we're, we're trying to learn to read signals in two dimensions. And I want to begin, uh, I always take refuge in poetry when I don't know what else to say. And this is from the American poet Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, I think I believe she was the she was the um, poet who spoke at the inauguration of um, uh, of Barack Obama. Poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner over here on the bus. God in the details. The only way to get from here to there. Poetry and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. Poetry, here I hear myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? If you, if you substituted the word chaplaincy for poetry, Chaplaincy is what you find in the dirt in the corner. God in the details. The only way to get from here to there. And I think that's what many here listening tonight have been engaged in and have been trying to do. And are we not of interest to each other? Well, yes, we are. And it's because of that that we are trying to develop a presence to one another. Um, I'm going to be quoting Pope Francis quite a lot this evening because he's been doing a huge amount of very public reflecting on what we're, what we're learning out of this extraordinary experience. 
before COVID began, he talked about an evangelizing community getting involved by word and deed in people's daily lives. It bridges distances and it embraces human life, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. Evangelizers thus take on the smell of the sheep and the sheep are willing to hear their voice. Well, again, I think if you substitute the word evangelizer for chaplain, getting involved by word and deed in people's daily lives, bridging distances, embracing human life, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. And there are ways of touching that suffering flesh that don't actually need human touch. And you've been so extraordinarily imaginative, many of you, in finding ways beyond touch, nevertheless, to touch people's lives. And he goes on, Jesus wants us to touch the suffering flesh of others. He hopes that we'll stop looking for those personal or communal niches which shelter us from the maelstrom of human misfortune and instead enter into the reality of other people's lives and know the power of tenderness. And then I love the very throwaway next comment. Whenever we do so, our lives become wonderfully complicated. And we experience what it is to be a people, to be part of a people. And I was thinking particularly when listening to um, the reflection on theatre chaplaincy, um, how much of that sounded to me like an attempt to help people to experience what it is to be a people, to be part of a people, to be part of a community. And this has been such an extraordinary experience, both of dislocation and for some of us also of relocation, of disconnection and reconnection, of learning how to create community, as well as learning how desperately we need community. And we cannot, even if we've wanted to be sheltered from the maelstrom of human misfortune in personal or communal niches, those niches have been closed to us. And that is why chaplaincy is so immensely important. Now, some years ago when I was uh, directing uh, a group of people through a 30-day um, Ignatian retreat, one of my retreatants was a recovering alcoholic and alcohol and substance abuser. She was the most truly remarkable woman who had moved from being a one and a half bottles of vodka a day to being clean and sober. And she spoke a lot in the kind of acronyms that AA tends to like. And one of the most important acronyms she held on to was one that I have found myself reflecting on for years, both as a chaplain and with other people in chaplaincy, which is to say that it's important that we never let ourselves get too hungry, too angry, too lonely, or too tired. Because it's when we do that, that the compulsive behaviors, the um, addictions kick in. And I tend to do talks about this to clergy and other people in pastoral ministries because it's so easy for us to get burnt out by allowing ourselves to get too hungry for the things that deeply nourish us, too angry about things that we may not necessarily be able to change or control, too lonely through being present to others but forgetting to be present to ourselves and to seek others to be present to us and basically too tired. So if I were to take, if there were to be one takeaway from my talk for any of you out there who are chaplains, it's to take the acronym HALT really seriously. But equally part of chaplaincy is dealing with people who are <laughs> hungry, sorry? And that was just some a noise. Right. <laughs> Although I just, I should say, actually, we just have a, maybe a couple more minutes before we. Thank you. Talk. Yes, I thought that was you squeaking. It wasn't me, actually. But... Right. <laughs> so. Okay. So if I can continue, um, it it really would. We are dealing with people who are hungry for what nourishes their spirit, who are very often angry and frustrated by, particularly at the moment, a situation that none of us is in control of. 
we are most of us experiencing profound loneliness because this has isolated us from those we love and many many of us myself included are dog tired so chaplaincy online involves learning to read signals in a virtual world in a way that is helpful and ultimately fruitful to the other and in the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius warns the director for which read chaplain, pastor, accompanier, whatever it is you're doing, to assure better cooperation between one giving the exercises and the recipient of their care and more beneficial results for both, it's necessary to suppose that every good Christian for which read good seeker, good person, is more ready to put a good interpretation on another statement than to condemn it as false. So we're beginning chaplaincy with an assumption of positive intent and the importance of having someone who assumes positive intent on our behalf cannot be overstated. And that is why when we actually are carrying the cross with and for one another, that assumption of each other's positive intent is immensely important. Pope Francis says COVID has unmasked the other pandemic, the virus of indifference, which is the result of constantly looking away, telling ourselves that because there's no immediate or magic solution, it's better not to feel anything. This crisis unmasks our vulnerability, exposes the false securities on which we had based our lives. So there's a great deal for us in providing a space where people can unmask can take away, can take off the masks by which they very often protect themselves from the indifference of others or the despair of feeling that because there's no immediate and magic solution, there's nothing that can be done at all. They often end up feeling rubbish and rubbish, rubbished by others. And it's the great task, it seems to me, of anybody in chaplaincy uh, to be a great recycler, to take the rubbish of other people's lives and help them by reflecting on it to turn it into treasure. In his most recent uh, book, Let Us Dream, Pope Francis quotes lines from Friedrich Hölderlin, which he says have often come back to him in pivotal moments in his life, where the danger is also grows the saving power. Where the danger is also grows the saving power and it seems to me that those there is a huge underlying invitation there in what how we are seeing this particular moment and he goes on in reflection of that we must not let the current clarifying moment pass us by so our job any of us who are holding any kind of pastoral um, presence with others, accompanying others, is helping by opening them to understanding and to reflecting, not just on what's happening, which is the surface kind of, okay, these are the facts, but the much harder question, the deeper question of what's going on. Most of us can talk to ourselves and each other about what's happening it's harder for us to get a grip on what's going on. As the poet says, we have the experience, but we miss the meaning. And at the heart of chaplaincy, as at the heart of the Ignatian spiritual exercises, is helping people to reflect on the experience in such a way that they actually begin to get in touch with the meaning. And so... Emma, we are yeah. going to have to quickly move soon. Thank to you. I'm about to, this is my last <laughs> If I may, can I finish the last sentence? Is that yes, coming? please do. Thank you. So if we can focus on the difference for people, with people, between what's happening and what's going on, we can help them to have the experience and get the meaning so that we don't let this current clarifying moment pass us by. Many thanks. Thank you so much to all of our panellists. What um, rich and varied reflections, uh, both the hard and the soft, um, on this clarifying moment that we find ourselves in. Um, we're now going to open up the chat box. 
Um, so all of the questions you've had um, storing up in your minds, then you're, you can soon unleash them um, to the wider crowd. Um, so please do be um, writing those down. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a general question first, though, um, if any of the panellists have any thoughts on this. Um, I realise that we have lots of chaplains with us um, tonight, but perhaps also some um, non-chaplains as well. I'm sure we have those. I know we have those. Um, I'm wondering um, if anybody would be willing to give thoughts on um, the ways in which their experiences of chaplaincy can be translated to those of us who are not chaplains in our own accompanying roles, um, perhaps less formally, but... Um, you know, in any of the ways we find ourselves offering spiritual or pastoral care uh, in the pandemic. Uh, and I would also just say we want to get through plenty of um, questions if we can. So um, do try and keep your answers um, brief if possible. Do you want me to? Uh, yeah, uh, Lindsay first. <laughs> Lindsay and Mira, yes, in that order, maybe. I think um, uh, you don't have to be a chaplain to also address existential questions of life, which we're all kind of part of, and the, the spiritual layers. Um, so if you're not a chaplain, not to worry. I think we very much face the questions ourselves as well as people around us, um, questions such as why me, why them, uh, what is happening to me now, how will the future look like, and those kind of... Um, those questions that you can't immediately answer, those are existential of nature. And I think if you're supporting people by just being there and listening to them and just trying to hear them and, and their worries and concerns, then that's already very pastoral. And I think that's what we should all do for each other during this time, because uh, we need as much a support as, um, as we can, don't we? Great, thanks so much. Mia, if you would like to. Uh... Yeah, I think there's a lot of hidden loneliness around at the moment. Um, uh, uh, some people are, are overly busy and some people are, are very isolated. So I kind of think it would be quite good to notice um, what's, what's happening in people's lives. And just um, without making people feel pitiful or anything like that, perhaps just um, say to somebody what a good job they're doing because they might not realise it the exhaustion may have um, stopped their feeling of self-worth. Um, or if somebody is perhaps lonely or is perhaps uh, isolated, then perhaps um, giving a phone, sending them a little flower through the post, taking them around a cake, things like that. Um, you don't have to go in, um, but it can mean so much to people. Great, thanks. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add there? Or I, I, I would certainly want to say from my experience that it is absolutely, if, if, you, if you remember nothing else from tonight, I would ask you to remember HALT, H-A-L-T. For anyone who's in any kind of caring or supportive role to others, because it is so easy to forget that we need that ourselves and for us to run out of steam um, in all sorts of quite serious um, ways so not to let ourselves in helping others you know where it says on a plane you've got to put your own mask on first before you help anyone else put theirs on and it always seems so counterintuitive you know but actually I think there's something there about making sure as a company as we don't get too hungry angry lonely or tired ourselves I think I would just want to add to that a little biblical reflection I often find myself reminding people that in the bible Jesus tell us, tells us to love others, love our neighbours as we love ourselves. And that's such a crucial two-letter word, as we love ourselves. Not more than, but not less than. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, we've also had some questions in advance, as I mentioned. And we had one on um, essentially confidentiality. So obviously, one of the things that's... Um, a sort of um, byproduct of moving online is that lots of correspondence is either recordable or forwardable. Um, I'm wondering if any of the um, panelists have experience of that being a problem. Uh, Simon, if that's come up in the research, whether it's something that you've had to think more about um, or um, whether that's it's not really come up. Uh, interested to know um, from that sort of almost legal dimension. 
It's not it's not something that particularly came up in um, in the interviews with with the university chaplains, but it is an interesting it is an interesting question. What happens if if pastoral and spiritual care is primarily online, and um, somebody either either person in the in the in the conversation then goes and forwards an email? Um, there has to be a certain netiquette for for this kind of pastoral and spiritual care that participants have to have to understand when they're when they're when they're going into um chaplains are obviously uh you know see, seeing their com conversations as confidential as, as 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 far as they can um but it's important i imagine it's important that uh encouraging people who are who are coming to chaplains to understand that as well so there's a shared understanding of, of the netiquette Mia has got her hand up. Yeah, I think this is one of the areas where you see a real difference between um, the so-called voluntary chaplains and the so-called employed chaplains, particularly in the NHS uh, categories, um, but also in, um, in emergency services, that there is a very strong um, move within NHS that you shouldn't do anything uh, which isn't from an encrypted point of view. Um, so you, you shouldn't use WhatsApp, um, you shouldn't use um, Zoom. We're not allowed to use Zoom uh, because that's not considered to be strong enough. Uh, we have to use uh, Teams, we have to use uh, various other uh, Skype for business. We can't use ordinary Skype. Um, we shouldn't be using anything that is recorded. We shouldn't be using any uh, private emails. Um, and that's a huge area when people are working from home that you actually have to have an encrypted uh, account in order to be able to then email them with anything that could be patient identifiable. Um, and there are lots and lots of issues with regards to uh, how that is then recorded, uh, recorded on notes, et cetera. Um, and uh, we find that people from outside of the hospital are sending us all kinds of information because they can't come in um, and then expecting lots of information back and we can't give it. We can't give it and people get very angry with us sometimes um, because but we can't do that. Lindsay Van Dyke. <laughs> Thank you Maddie. Um, also to pick up on the chat Mark Newitt wrote um, something quite crucial that you also uh, are able to record in a face-to-face -face encounter and it's actually majority is about consent if we're looking at it and perhaps the pandemic and different ways of working maybe be through phone or digital platforms has prompted us to remind ourselves about what consent actually looks like and how to guarantee privacy and confidentiality again. Um, because of course there are lots of creative ideas as well with regards to uh, online support or phone support, but to actually also have a robust system around that and how that would look like with gathering that consent, what kind of data you will be collecting aligned with GDPR regulations and that um, the participants are aware of that, how it's being processed and where it's going to be stored is of crucial importance. And we don't always seem to do that. So maybe this allows us now to rethink how we do that as well, face to face. Brilliant. Any of the other participants want to come in that or we can go to the next question? No? Um, another in advance question, and then we'll move to the, um, the chat box there. Um, Someone has asked, to what extent are the recommendations outlined in Simon's report applicable to chaplaincy provision in other sectors? So I guess we have chaplains from various sectors on the panel here. Um, so I'm sure they would like to speak to that. But also, um, as a follow-up question to that, um, what recommendations would you like to see in your sector? So uh, we had recommendations not only for chaplains themselves, but also for the institutions um, and faith groups. So I suppose... Um, Maybe those are categories that, that you could speak to. Or a question which requires thought. I, I, sorry, I don't want to talk again. No, please <laughs> um, do. No, it's, it's a fascinating report. And it's really interesting to read it, Simon, as well. And of course, uh, with my hat on as a humanist and non-religious, I was also really interested to read that a lot of service users, of course, were of a non-religious uh, background too. Um, so coming from that perspective, but also overall within chaplaincy provision, uh, with may it be in universities, may it be in healthcare, for me the crucial point is that diversity, and like Mia was saying as well, to demonstrate the demographic, to have that 
um, well, that like-minded support for anybody, regardless of their faith and beliefs, so they can actually relate to that particular worldview if that's what they want. So I think those were the reflections that we should also have a bit more of, perhaps in healthcare with the chaplaincy guidelines coming up again for revision. That's something that we can carry over to look at that crucially. Thanks so much, Lindsay. That's really helpful. Mia? Uh, I, I'm just thinking more um, along the lines of what I would like to see. Um, I used to be a, a, a hospital, uh, sorry, a, a, an education chaplain once in the university. And it is a different animal to um, to healthcare or to fire, very, very different animal. Um, and I, I don't want to, it's so many years ago now, I don't want to say things that, because, it, you know, things have moved on since I did it 30 or 40 years ago, um, 35 years ago, in fact. Um, but the, um, the, one of the big problems that we have as healthcare chaplains is that it's not mandatory. So a prison chaplaincy is mandatory, but, uh, but healthcare is not. And it's only guidance. There's, there's no actual um, regulations concerning us, uh, which I don't see that you could ever do that in education. But where um, healthcare is concerned, I do think it ought to be a mandatory profession. Uh, and I think it ought to be um, legally there and it should be an understanding then that spiritual care is an expertise in its own right. It's not, a, we're not counsellors, we're, we're spiritual caregivers. It's a different role. There's plenty of counsellors there. We are spiritual care, caregivers and we do a completely different role. There is nobody else allowed to do what we do in health. Um, and, um, and they, you know, a nurse, if they did what we did, could lose their job. Uh, we are allowed to do what we do, um, and we are illegally allowed to do it. But we're not. We don't. We don't have a, that protection under the law. So, if you could get that sorted out for us, that would make life a lot easier. Please, thank you. <laughs> Mia, as a, as a starting point on that, maybe if there are people on the call who don't know anything at all about chaplaincy but may have that in their power, it might be helpful for you to say a bit about what the differences are between counselling and chaplaincy a bit more if you could elaborate on sort of how would how should they think of those differences well a proper a, a proper nhs counsellor would actually be um accredited counsellor they'd be properly trained they'd be uh having appropriate supervision they'd be using models that had been that, that they've been taught within uh, their counselling uh courses uh, they would also offer a, a, a beginning middle and end of a therapeutic relationship so they'd have a uh, a write-up they'd know exactly where they were going you know they'd have identification of the problem they'd then have say six sessions normally maybe up to ten if it's a serious session and then they would finish and then they would go on from that chaplaincy tends to we don't tend to uh, have appointments with people we're working at the, at the existential level rather than at an emotional level then the emotional level will come in as well but we see that spiritual care at a deeper level than the emotional level but it has an effect as it comes out through emotions, etc. But we're looking, if you like, at soul pain rather than emotional pain, I suppose is a, is a, a quick fix way of talking about it. Great, that's really helpful and constructive. Ooh, there's a bit of feedback there, I think. Um, we're gonna move to the chat questions, you'll all be pleased to know. Um, I've got one through here. There have been lots of losses to ways of working, but I'd be interested to know what the presenters would wish to continue from things they have started due to the pandemic. So. You know, what have been the good things that you've learned or changed or started that um, you'd like to see um, move forward? Lindsay Mida. I think, as I mentioned, it's, it's the accessibility through these online platforms that most of us had never even heard of a year ago um, that really does open up an opportunity. Um, and certainly in the theatre chaplaincy context, um, we're developing the chaplaincy in the West End, first of all, with a view to rolling it out up and down the country. But in some ways, this has actually given us a head start because we've already been able to connect with theatre people up and down the land. And I think it would be a shame going forward if we were just to completely dispense with that. I think we need to, uh, again, it comes back to this thing of a, a blended offering. We need to see what, it, what are the best riches of that that we can take with us going forward so we don't lose the ground that we've actually made. Thanks. Other panelists have uh, Gemma. 
I would I would say that you know that that word blended is really important because I mean both uh, in the teaching profession in the same way I think we've learned an enormous about about how to be much more flexible and to make ourselves more accessible and to think of that as normal and while I have to say I would never want to swap face to face you know three dimensional work simply for two dimensional work i've come to have a much greater respect for the um the possibilities um the potential of uh, online work for chaplaincy and accompaniment of all sorts it does work and it's not necessarily a kind of poor substitute sometimes it can actually be in all sorts of ways easier for people to still be in their own environment and therefore they feel safer um, they feel more able to, to to talk about what really matters to them because they haven't had to come out into someone else's environment and there's there's a lot to be said for that so I think there's a learning there about how we can be present to people in different contexts through doing stuff online it's really helpful Certainly um, in the Theos context, we know that we're in some ways more accessible because we have um, reached far more people during online events than we can fit in our basement, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, Simon, I think you had something. Yes, obviously um, not speaking from personal experience here, but just from some of the research, one of the really, one of the interesting things that stuck out to me was university chaplains using uh, student social media pages as an opportunity to uh, be humorous and present the chaplain as a source of humor, as, as, as a mechanism for building, uh, building community. So there was a, a nice little example of a university chaplain who got into the regular practice of posting um, a, puzzle, a puzzle challenge onto the, the student's uh, uh, Facebook, <coughs> page, uh, the, the, rate, the student's union Facebook page. And she would do this every day and and the students would have to guess what this image was. And it was just a nice little regular practice for students who were isolated, sat in their own rooms, but there was a moment where they knew this was gonna happen. They could all participate if they wanted to. It added a little structure and it added a little, um, a little humor to their day. And it reminded them in a, in a gentle way that the chaplain was there. So that kind of thing in the university context I think is really is really profitable presenting the chaplain as a source of fun and humor. Mm -hmm. Great. I think also with regards to um to training, we've done a lot of online training, uh, like we're doing actually tonight as well, like you were saying, and recording it. So we've got a huge knowledge bank that we're building on at the moment with lots of different interesting subjects that we can always share across different kinds of services too. So not just keep it within our chaplaincy kind of world which really seemed to help as well with putting chaplaincy again on the map uh, so that has been really helpful actually and that's something that we should continue rather than looking at the losses as the question posed uh, proposed um, and additionally i think personally reflecting i think it has helped develop my pastoral skills more because of the narrating that i referred to earlier um, I have to be even more present, which can be very draining. And I can probably look at the other panelists as well, that the span that you have with a person now is perhaps even more draining than before COVID because you have to do so much more and there's so many different layers you have to read at the same time. But it really helps develop and keep you on your toes. So um, I see that as a, as a plus side. Really helpful, thank you. Uh, moving from before and after to um, staying the same, we have a question here. It was touched on in the presentations, but would the panelists be able to say a few further words on the value of consistency? I think in chaplaincy, it's vital. Um, you know, we are there to provide support for people when times are really hard and often in moments of spiritual crisis. Um, and that consistency is vital because if we're not there or not seen to be available when we're needed, um, then that has serious repercussions. So I think too, I think too, but I mean, coming back to Gemma's halt, I think it's important that we do look after ourselves at the same time so we don't actually promise more than we can deliver so that we're realistic in, you know, in whatever we're offering, whatever way of output, whatever methods that is, that we actually, um, pace ourselves in that process um, and only then can we be genuinely consistent. It's really helpful. Other, Mia. Um, 
I, I think um, the, the very fact that we are a presence and a continuing presence on the wards, I'm um, talking about the healthcare or indeed at the fire stations, uh, I think that is really good because sometimes people can have a horrendous day, really bad day. And then they see you there and then they go, well, it can't be that bad on the ward because you're here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And actually, it's OK. You help people carry on. So I think the consistency there is really, really important. I also think that the fact <laughs> that it, when things are really difficult, they know that you're there. They can call you and you can you will come and you will come um, and and they're not left alone. So, because often when, when something really bad happens in the middle of the night, um, you're there for whatever, you know, the death of a baby, a death of an elder, it's usually a death or um, a very close death experience anyway. Um, and, and the staff are struggling so, so much. And you just the, the fact that you're consistently turning up and you're not running away and you're not saying, oh, I can only come on the phone or whatever it is. I can actually physically be there in the presence alongside somebody who is, is uh, really struggling. It's really, really important. So it's back to the presence again. Um, and that is so important. It's a sort of a, a reconciliation that actually um, it is happening um, and it's okay. We can still carry on. It's part of the processing. It feels like presence is a consistent theme in so much of this. Um, we had a question here about funding, about money. Um, interested in any reflections on the question of encouraging organisations to better fund chaplaincy um, at a time when finance is tighter than ever as a result of COVID. So, of course, um, COVID itself has had both um, emotional and financial implications. So how do we um, square that circle, as it were? I, th I think that also ties in with um, what Simon was saying in his report, that there's a lot of volunteers that are engaged with chaplaincy services and I can definitely see that as well within healthcare which is great because they're literally the bedrock of most chaplaincy services because without our volunteers we wouldn't be able to manage actually the referrals that we've got but that said that's also poses of course a problem a, a challenge especially during these times that we've been confronted with where the volunteers were not allowed to come in to protect themselves of course with getting any kind of um, COVID flu um, so there are some issues there that need addressing. We need more funding to actually do what we need to do. And the comparison that I'm making there is we wouldn't assume that nurses would have a larger um, uh, workforce that are volunteers rather than employed paid staff by the NHS. But often you see the other way around with chaplaincy. Well, actually we are professionals. We are, as Mia touched upon as well, it is a part of a, a motivation and a vocation, however you'd like to see it, but we're also professionals and we stand apart from other kinds of services such as counseling. We're part of that overall holistic service. So I think we definitely need to plead for more funding for paid chaplains, regardless of what sector we're looking at. Well, I think one of the arguments that we can put forward is that, um, you know, a client well-being. Um, is is and and employee well-being is money well spent. You know, if you've got a sick employer uh, employee, you've got somebody who's not being productive. Bottom line, and therefore, given that chaplaincy is about helping people to remain productive, even if there are serious difficulties and challenges to their health and well-being. Um, you know, it, it, it's a no-brainer that it's in the long run cheaper to keep people going, basically. Um, as they say in America, do the math. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a very clear case that can be made for this being part of employee and or client well-being in such a way that it keeps people, it keeps people out of hospitals very often because it stops them being unwell if they're being attended to, but it also keeps people in employment. So, you know, you, you'd have to work hard not to see that, I think. That uh, reminds me of one of the sort of, um, big topics of conversation within the team when we were thinking about this report in terms of how this would tie in with the future of work as well which is another um EOS project we have going on and of course one of simon's recommendations was around that being more important when there's um not necessarily a physical office i wonder if simon might um 
just be able to say a bit more about that recommendation and, and yeah. how things can feed in. Absolutely. And I think it, it I think this does come on to the theme of connect to the theme of funding. We've heard ways in which chaplains can demonstrate to employers their their necessity. And I think the themes of building relationships and encouraging hope are key ones to focus on and ones that I think after COVID, big employers might be more receptive to than they than they would have been previously because we're now understanding how important it is to have people around us with a remit to be encouraging hope. Uh, and, and so for chaplains already in, uh, already in an organization, that can be something to talk to their managers about to say, you know, this is why, this is why my role is significant and unique and contributing in a special way. Um, but it's also something that, um, that big employers themselves should be should be thinking about. Part of another another strand in this is our in in the report we recommend that in the case of university chaplaincy, um, it, it, local religion or belief organisations uh, could think about pooling resources to fund perhaps a part time chaplaincy post in their local university. So if you have if you have a local university where, for example, there isn't a Muslim uh, a Muslim chaplain or there isn't there's only a uh, that there isn't a, a paid Muslim chaplain, why could not local mosques come together and say, this is part of our social action to fund uh, a part-time role um, at the university. So we would encourage local religion or belief organizations to be thinking about that as well in partnership with the universities. Great, thanks so much, Simon. Uh, Mia, you had something to uh, add on that? Yes, I, I think, one of the ways that perhaps Theos could help um, chaplaincy in this area is by actually producing some evidence, um, because uh, in, in certainly in healthcare or even in the in the fire, I couldn't just walk up to um, the uh, funding people and just say finance people and you know say uh, I think it's a jolly good idea to have chaplains. We will help um, well-being of the staff. Uh, they wouldn't believe me we have to actually have evidence and it has to be evidence-based and it has to be good quality evidence uh, and anecdotal evidence isn't enough. I mean, it depends on which organization you're working with, but where paid chaplaincy is concerned, in, certainly in healthcare, uh, they have to decide whether they employ a psychologist, a, a wellbeing advisor, a speaking up champion, a counselor or a chaplain. And normally the chaplain would come at the end of the pile. Um, you have to really prove your worth um, and you really have to really fight for it. We have two separate, um, uh, what do we, I suppose, evaluations going on, paid evaluations going on right now um, for our work. Um, one which is with the psychologist and one which is just for the healthcare chaplaincy. Um, and it would be great if you would, uh, as an organization, would be able to give some evidence base um, uh, about the, the the role of healthcare chaplaincy and the role of all chaplaincy within promoting well-being at work in this difficult uh, situation that we're going to find ourselves over the next decade. Great. Um, thanks so much. We are very, very um, close to time. So I'm just going to ask um, one final question um, and then we will, um, well, it depends on how quickly people answer it, I suppose, as to whether we might be able to squeeze two more in, but I think we probably won't. Um, just before I do that, I want to say that um, I think there's some, um, there's a link in the chat box to give um, feedback on this event, and that would be really, really helpful to us. That survey is specifically tailored to this event, um, so we really would love to hear what you've thought about it and what we can um, do better or stay the same. Um, so I just want to mention that now before we um, start dropping off. Um, but we've got the, just time for one final question. I'm really sorry to those people who asked questions and um, didn't have them put to the panel, but um, we'll just end on this one, um, which is, have you found there has been an increase in requests for spiritual interventions such as prayer and how have you navigated this digitally? So I suppose that's a wider question about um, almost sort of not just what's happening, but what's going on, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so yeah, whoever would like to take that, please. Um. I would just say very quickly, yes, there has been. And you know, how have I dealt with it? By praying and by assuring people that I'm doing it. And um, you know, there we go, not forgetting to do what I've promised. End of. That was admirably 
<laughs> the point. Um, I can offer a short anecdotal response to that. Um, I mentioned that we had a prayer diary that we used to pray for a different group of people in the theatre every week. We now do it on a daily basis. And only today I had an email from someone in the profession, from a particular group in the profession, saying, uh, we've noticed this and how it really encourages people. Could you please add us to your list? We'd really appreciate it. And that's someone who I've never spoken to about prayer. I wouldn't think considers themselves in any way religious but it just shows in a way it, it can be a slow burn. Amazing. I've experienced indeed the spiritual existential side of things. So where people really want to create their own rituals, perhaps, or even those that are non-religious, for instance, that don't have um, a Christian faith, that want to derive meaning and purpose. So to have their own kinds of non-religious rituals in that sense. But that sense of belonging, I think, is very crucial. And that's something that's across the ball with, uh, with people I encounter. That's really interesting that people are searching for um, their own rituals as well in the sense of and this is such a new time that um, I guess it's only to be expected that there's some kind of um, existential agitation shall we say in the in the air. Um, brilliant um, in fact we do just have um, two minutes um, left so I just have time to um, give a massive thank you to um, our panelists. It's been really, really wonderful hearing um, such diverse um, contributions in, in such a wide range of different contexts and traditions. Um, also, thank you to the St. Luke's College Foundation who funded the actual research that we've been um, presenting tonight. Um, and thank you, obviously, all to, to all of you who've um, come and joined us in this evening. It's been really lovely to have so many people um, here um, to think through these issues. Um, please do get in contact um, if anything comes out of this for you. Um, Theos always is really, really excited to hear about um, what our research has sparked off for people. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. I think we're gonna have a closing slide now. And I also should remind you again to give us um, feedback on the event because um, that's really, really helpful as well. Um, great, have a wonderful evening everybody.